I'm Pauline Kael, and I write about movies for The New Yorker. When I write about movies, all my experience and reactions seem to come together, and there, there's, uh, there's an exhilaration for me, and I think sometimes it shows up in the, in the prose. I had always been involved in movies, but almost equally involved in the other arts, and I started to write after college and somehow everything seemed to come together when I wrote about movies. When I wrote about books, I was a little academic. When I wrote about the theater, there was something missing. But when I wrote about movies, all my other interests came into play and somehow there was some excitement in the writing that there wasn't in anything else. But you know, movies are so integral to, to our lives. I mean, they could, can mean so much to us and they affect us so much, but it's fascinating to, to write about them and try to figure out the ways in which we're responding and what they're doing to us and what they're doing to other people. I think it's one of the reasons why people like to read movie criticism because often they're so affected emotionally that they want to read a critic to sort out their reactions and find out if they were unusual or if other people reacted the same way or why they were so upset by a given movie. There are a lot of ways in which movies affect us, even simple movies that are, are really not quite uh, at our surface conscious level. Most people in any field don't do a very good job. That's true of university professors. It's true even of janitors. And, uh, you know, I think someone has said that 85% of the people in any field are incompetent. And I think that's probably true of, of criticism. But the other 15% are often quite marvelous, and it's amazing how hard they will work and how much they will care about what they are doing. The world is really divided, I guess, between the people who, who get deep pleasure from doing a good job and the ones who are just trying to get through the day. And there are a great many critics who are just trying to get through the day. Well, I think they come to films later in life. They don't go to movies as kids the way I did. And so it's an educated response. Often they started with Ingmar Bergman or they start with even later figures now. They don't start with that kid sense of that stinks. <laughs> and, and that's a very important sense to have. Have. But remember, when I wrote about Bonnie and Clyde for The New Yorker, I had over 20 years of writing about movies behind me. I mean, I'd written for Partisan Review and Sight and Sound and Film Quarterly and all sorts of magazines for many years. They were scattered pieces, and so people didn't really register me, but I was, I was learning to write more freely. I think the more educated I got, the more willing I was to write like a kid. And I think this is an important aspect of criticism, because most people who talk about the complexities of movies, it's because they're simple. Uh, and, the, uh, I mean, movies are not that difficult. Uh, you can go, and if you can't understand a movie, generally it's because it's badly made. I mean, at a certain level of intelligence, there's no great hassle in the movies. Movies are not that deep a medium in most usages, and the greatest movies ever made can be understood at one seeing. And this idea that you have to go to them over and over and over again to get that gem of meaning, which really you got the first time, uh, is quite absurd. Most people will finally admit, like Dwight McDonald, who finally admitted that after he'd been to Marion Bath the sixth time, he really didn't understand understand anymore. Uh, but there is a feeling that compulsively they should go back. And, and I think this is very bad. I think if you love a movie, go back and see it because you'll enjoy it more. But if you didn't like it and feel sort of culturally dislocated, the hell with it. I mean, it's, it's not as if you were studying surgery and some little step along the way, you know, was crucial if you didn't understand it. If there's a movie you don't like, forget it. Only bad critics impose an academic formula, and one does not need to rationalize one's instincts. One's instincts are the sum total of one's mind and responses. If, if you can't respond fully and completely as a human being, there's something the matter with you if you're so split that you have to rationalize your instincts. I mean, presumably, if, if you're together at all, all of you is reacting together. I'm not some mechanist making a division between mind and instinct. You learn to respond as totally as possible, and you know what you think of a film when you see it, just as everybody in the audience does, because everybody's a critic in that sense. The difference between somebody working in the field professionally is that I go home and I try to pull out of myself why I reacted that way. 
because what I try to do in a review is make explicit what is implicit in my reactions. Because you react totally, but then it's the hell of, of trying to write how you got that way. I mean, why you felt the way you did, why you think it's important, uh, what in it struck you, and what you think is going to be important for other people, how the film's going to interact with an audience. But I think I perhaps linked it to personal experience more, and, and I was certainly attacked for that more. People didn't understand why I was doing it. I was doing it as a way of being truthful to how movies affected us. Not that I wanted to exploit my domestic life. I, I only see a movie once, absolutely once. Uh, if, if I really love a movie, maybe five or ten years later, uh, I may want to see it again. Uh, but uh, I think that the first response to a movie is the most important. Now this varies. Some critics need to see a movie many times because they don't remember it. I have an almost iron memory for movies. I do remember the dialogue and the details. I can give you almost a shot-by-shot -shot analysis of a movie after one seeing. And uh, this is simply a matter of having worked in the field a very, very long time. Uh, but also, my first response is the most total. Then, if I didn't like something, then I might be influenced by other people. And so I'd go and start looking for what other people say is there, and actually I'd start falsifying my own response. I think the first is the best. And afterward, if I go, it's strictly for my own pleasure, but I review it after seeing it once. The great thing about writing fast and writing immediately is that I think you get an, almost an exact fidelity to what you really felt, because you don't have, uh, you're not worried by what other people then think of the work. You're, uh, you're, you're, you're strictly on your own at the point at which you write about it. And so you're, you're trying to make explicit your own feelings in the, in the act of writing. And of course, the excitement is when you discover something about yourself uh, in the act of writing. And that is possible in criticism. I, it doesn't happen often. Uh, but I think when criticism is really good, that's what you're doing. I mean, you're working out your relationship to that material. Uh, if it's simply a matter of explaining to other people why a work is, is bad, there isn't the same excitement in the process, and I think the, the prose doesn't have uh, the same power. But if, if it's a process of self-discovery and, and of thinking about new things, of thinking about things you've never got at before, uh, then it's really a very exciting process, and I don't know that it's that different uh, from other forms of writing. Most people think of criticism as parasitic, but when it's really a process of discovery within the work and of discovery within yourself, I don't think it is parasitic. Uh, and, and of course, even when it is parasitic, even when it is strictly judging the work, uh, it's still a necessary function because, of course, the alternative is simply advertising. And somebody in a society has to make these judgments or else people will simply go where the advertising money is. But I loved it when I did it. It came very easy to me. I never have understood people who found it an ordeal to sit down and write a movie review because I love the process of the way all the associations you make in your mind come into play in the course of a review. The way you discover connections in the movie itself and and the way the movie connects to your life that you weren't fully conscious of at the start. I think it happened really because I was trying to write about movies in terms that seemed honest to me instead of those pontifical academic terms which were very common in criticism that drove me a little bit wild. It seemed to me that people didn't deal with why they really liked or disliked a movie. They dealt with why they thought they should like or dislike it. Academics tend to be afraid of new work and they derive their standards from old work and then impose it on new work and so they reject practically everything new and that's why they often have such a bad record for for opposing great artists because they're afraid of something that doesn't fit their standards and in, in criticism, particularly in a pop form like movies, if you're not open to something new, uh, well, you're, a total, you're totally irresponsible and foolish because the old has been done so many times. Everybody jumps on the bandwagon of any old success and repeats it. So it's only the people like Godard and Altman who try to do something new who spell the health of the medium. I love seeing a good movie because then I know I will have the fun of trying to share 
share that experience with other people. Uh, I, I never go to a movie wanting it to be bad. I always go wanting it to be good because then I'll have something new to say. I mean, an innovative movie means I'll have something new to write about. And that's, that's the most exciting part of being a critic. There are moments all the time in movies that quite surprise me. I think that happens from our earliest movie going. In D.W. Griffith's Intolerance, there's one moment when a little chariot pulled by doves crosses the screen. You wouldn't believe it was possible for something like that to be as affecting as it is, but every time I think of that image, something melts. How can you love movies and not be sensual? I mean, that's one of the things that makes us prefer movies to other art forms when we're kids. I mean, a play just doesn't bring the people as close, doesn't make us that aware of, of their sensuality. And, and it doesn't give us the intensity of a performer with the same directness that a movie can. It's one of the things we love movies for. I used to be kidded for the sexual titles of my books. They were absolutely consciously chosen to try to indicate how directly movies could affect us. And I find that educated people want to fight that direct response. They don't seem to realize it's one of the greatest things we have available. <laughs> The process is simply um, thinking, really. I mean, writing is, is simply, you know, putting down what you think. And to be paid for thinking, uh, and to know that you're doing something that, that may even have some value that, you know, that some other people might enjoy that process and share it with you. I mean, that's, that's a marvelous way to live. I mean, I can't think of any better way to live.